Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. So, sorry we've had so many difficulties. Uh, on the way here, my flight got delayed twice, so I actually arrived at 2 a.m., so I'm a little tired as well. Apparently, the internet is a little tired because these slides are... I only have 53 slides of full images, so this should be like just like a moment. Um, this, this talk is called uh, what Rust can teach us about Ruby. And uh, as Juan mentioned, um, I used to do a whole lot of Ruby. I actually have a Ruby tattoo. Um, I love Ruby very much, but I've been working on this other programming language, Rust, for the last two years or so. And Rubyists in general, uh, historically, have, have been polyglot programmers. They love to use multiple languages. There's like a long-standing joke that there's just as many JavaScript talks at Ruby conferences as there are Ruby talks at Ruby conferences. So I know that you all are definitely interested in programming in multiple languages. So what I wanted to share with you is a little bit about why Rust could help you understand Ruby better and why programming in Rust might be interesting to you. Um, I'm hoping that my other slides are also loading in the background. Let's, let's find out together. Uh, hey. Um, so first, I'm going to start to talk about programming languages in general and this abstraction word that we all love to use. Um, programmers use the word abstraction very, very often. And that's because in some ways, all of programming is just about building abstractions, different kinds of abstractions, better abstractions, Worse abstractions, we talk about abstractions being leaky abstractions, and it's always, it's always about abstraction. So that's where we need to start when we talk about uh, languages. What's, what's funny is when we talk about these different kinds of abstractions, we often talk about levels of abstraction. So there are like high level abstractions and low level abstractions. And this is a reference to this story about it being turtles all the way down. I don't know if anyone knows that story or not. Um, but um, <clears throat> what's funny is, is that we, we put them in this order, like high versus low, like it's one directional. But that's not actually true. Um, it's, not, it's not an up and down. There's also a lot of side to side when it comes to abstractions. And so one example that I'll give of how these things can be different is there's, there's always this tension in programming. So we have a piece of computer code, and we can go in two directions. One of them is sort of the theory direction, and the other one I like to call the like, hardware direction. So either your program is a representation of a certain kind of math, and then that math is based in something like the lambda calculus or uh, you know, more and more abstract math notation. Or your program is code that is running on a physical computer that definitely is not based in math and has a lot of like, physical uh, limitations. Um, so we either go like, in a direction of more and more abstract, more math, uh, harder, to, harder to understand, or we go down to, here's how my code executes on the Ruby virtual machine, which is running on an actual processor, which executes microcode, which makes the like, physical electricity in your chip move around, which means that electrons are moving. And then like, the more physics you get into it, the more confusing it gets again. Like, like we know a lot about the middle, but once we get to these ends of the abstraction, uh, things get a lot more confusing. Um, but these two paths are completely distinct from one another. Like the, the physics direction is very different than the abstract math direction. So I think that thinking about abstractions as just being high or low doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, this is something that my operating systems professor told me in college, and that is an operating system's job is to lie. Um, and this is one of the few things that's really stuck with me throughout college. So um, I don't know how many of you know a lot about operating systems and how they work, but basically, um, each program on your computer thinks that it is the only computer, run only program running on that computer. And it thinks that it has access to the maximum amount of RAM that your hardware architecture can support. And so the operating system's job is to shuffle things around so that each program believes that it's unique and special and it is only the only program running on the computer. Um, and so like fundamentally, 
operating systems are about lying to your programs. Like your programs are operating in like a dream world that doesn't actually exist. Uh, even stuff like pointer math with virtual memory and how that works, your, your pointer locations is actually, there's like a translation step to the physical memory. Even when you're programming at the level of assembly, it's still not like actually the real numbers. And so it can be really hard to unravel all of these lies. And in many ways, I like to think of abstractions as just convenient lies anyway. Like you're, you're admitting part of the capital T truth um, in order to be convenient because the problem is is that with all these abstractions and all these directions, if we didn't, you can't possibly think about all things at once. So for example, we're talking about programming languages today, but we're also you know, uh, heavily using human language abstraction. I'm giving this presentation in English. Some of you know English well enough uh, to be able to understand it. Others are using this translator. Um, and I have some Japanese on a slide in a minute. Uh, and I have some assembly language later. And so like, language is a way for me to take the thoughts that are in my brain, serialize them, send them over the network, and then your brain deserializes them. And hopefully, we don't lose anything in that transmission process. But you can't think about that all the time. So we need abstractions because it's just absolutely impossible. Like Even if I think about the way that language is communicating to you, I could, if I wanted to think about like everything that's involved, I would have to think about the physics of sound and how that impacts your ears and like things like slang. It's just there's just far too many things to possibly think about. And so the only way that our brains can cope is by creating abstractions. Um, there's a really great talk by Konstantin Haza called Magenta. And it's largely a talk about abstractions. And he actually discusses how your brain uh, lies about what's coming in in your eyes, even. Like our basic physical senses are actually abstractions. And we're constantly just lying to us. Um, it's a little early in the morning for that, sorry. Juan put me first. Um, and so if we're operating in this universe of lies, um, how do we get anything done? Well, by working with these abstractions, we can gain intuitions about how the system actually works. So what I want to try to show you is how working in a lower level programming language like Rust can help you develop intuitions when you're working in a higher level language like Ruby. And there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, and so it's also weird because Rust is kind of low level, but also kind of high level at the same time. And I'm going to talk about low level details of Ruby, even though Ruby is a high level language. So it gets, it gets a little messy. But my point is, is that you can never learn everything about computers. So you always need to kind of develop these intuitions for the parts that you don't actually know. Um, and even when you do know those things, you'll forget them sometimes. So like, I used to know a lot about low-level programming and assembly and operating systems in college. And then I learned Ruby. And I was like, I can forget about all this. Awesome. I don't need to think about it anymore. Um, this is my Japanese slide. Uh, this is the third time I've given this talk. And as I was preparing for the first time, I figured out that uh, Koichi Sasada, the like, author of MRI, was going to be in the audience. And so I'm about to like, present his work in an abstract way that's like lying about it, basically. So this says, I'm sorry, Koichi, uh, in Japanese. Um, <laughs> and then after the talk, he was like, I actually do have a number of complaints. And so I've addressed some of the things that he pointed out. Um, nobody's perfect. Um, if you really want to learn about Ruby at a low level, you should get this book. Um, I stole some of my diagrams directly from the book itself, uh, Ruby Under a Microscope by Pat Shaughnessy. And it's a really fantastic way to understand how Ruby works at a lower level, which will make you a better Ruby programmer. Um, and it's also kind of an introduction to programming languages and how they work, which is what I'm about to talk about. But you can learn a lot more and a lot more in depth um, from this book. You should definitely read it. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about Ruby and Rust along two axes. One of them is speed, and one of them is expressiveness. So we like to say in the Ruby world that Ruby is a slow programming language. And we still love it. We still love it anyway, even though it's slow. And what's funny about this is that Ruby is a language. There's different implementations of that language. Like JRuby is very fast, actually. So even saying Ruby is slow is an abstraction that's a lie. Uh, but generally speaking, across programming languages, Ruby tends to be a slower programming language. 
Well, why is that? It turns out that the fundamental way that the language is designed makes it slower. And that's totally okay. Um, not every program needs to be super fast, but by learning a little bit about how Ruby works, we can see why Ruby needs to be this slower programming language. Um, and so that's what I wanna start off by sharing with you. Okay, let's talk about how programs actually get executed by a computer. So in the beginning, there's code. And then um, the programming language takes that code and it does this thing called tokenize it, which means turn it into tokens. Tokens are each individual chunk of the text of the, the program itself. Um, it takes these tokens and then it tries to make sense out of them. So, and that's called parsing. The way I like to think about the difference between tokenizing and parsing is that if you try to make a sentence out of words that are all valid words in your language, but they don't make any grammatical sense, that's the tokenizing part. And then checking that the grammar makes sense or that it's a sentence that you can actually understand, that's the parsing part. So they're related, but a little bit different. Um, then there's this step uh, where we take the parsed version and we compile it into some other form. Um, and so compiling historically meant turning your programming language into assembly language, but really you can compile any language into any other language. Some people have invented a new word called transpiling for this, but it's really the same as compiling. So like when you compile your coffee script into JavaScript, then your JavaScript gets compiled into assembly language and you know, there's a bunch of different steps uh, here. But then finally, at least in Ruby's case, um, after your program is compiled, because Ruby 1.9 actually does compile your code, uh, it runs, in this case, in the interpreter, uh, the MRI virtual machine. Um, and in fact, this compilation step was one of the biggest changes from Ruby 1.8 to Ruby 1.9. Um, Ruby actually nowadays is this virtual machine that, your, that the Ruby uh, like program compiles your Ruby program into instructions for that machine first. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why Ruby 1.9 is significantly faster than 1.8 and a whole bunch of other like really wonderful things that have, uh, that have happened in that transition from a long time ago. Um, so I wanna go through this again because it's very early in the morning, um, but also to give you some visuals to like help you understand how this process works. So two plus two is a valid Ruby program um, and that's our code that we have as, as text in a text file somewhere. Um, tokenizing takes that code and it turns it from two plus two into an integer plus a plus operation and another integer. Um, then parsing turns that into a form that we can understand. So plus is operating on the two and the other two. So there's this tree structure. Um, you often see the tokenized to parsing step is like going from a linear thing to a tree form. Um, so this is the MRI bytecode that two plus two turns into. Um, you can actually ask the Ruby interpreter to compile your programs and spit out the bytecode and inspect all that. There's a VM class, a virtual machine class. Um, and so this is what, these are the eight steps. Uh, trace one, I'm actually not 100% sure what that does. Uh, put object two and then another two and then the plus operation and then leave, which I kind of like instead of return. It's like, bye, I'm done. Uh, I don't know, it's like a quirky little thing that's kind of fun. Um, so that's the Ruby, and that's how the Ruby executes this kind of um, program. And the thing that I wanna um, impress on you here is that different programming languages have different ways to model their computations, and those models directly affect the amount of performance or expressiveness that you can get out of your programming language. So. For example, before in Ruby 1.8, when it didn't have that compile step, every single time you ran your program, it would need to do the parsing, the tokenizing, um, all that stuff every single time. And that significantly contributed to Ruby being slow. Um, we still kind of do that, but we wouldn't actually have to. Um, one of the interesting things is, again, this is based on your actual uh, implementation. So JRuby does all those steps and then gives you a jar, which is like the compiled version 
um, and then you can use it. But these different kinds of models and these different ways of thinking about problems have different performance characteristics, and they affect the way that your program works. Um, so Rust. Um, in the Rust world, we have, this is our unofficial mascot, uh, Ferris the Crab, uh, which is a pun, because Ferris sounds like iron, uh, but Ferris is also a person's name. Uh, and we call ourselves Rustations, like crustations for crabs. Um, anyway, so uh, I've been joking, there's also sort of a joke in this slide that uh, you can see that I just put an ST on top of the Ruby. Uh, I've been joking that I'm only programming in languages that start with RU from now on. Like that's, all my work is in RU languages. I don't know how many more words we can get, how many more programming names, but. Um, so Rust, one of the things that Rust does as a compiled language is that it separates the first chunk of those steps from the actual execution. So when you call Rust C for Rust compile on your foo.rs file, um, this ruins my tab completion because RB versus RS, whenever I have them in the same directory, it, it never works. Um, and also .rs is the country code for Serbia, so all of the domains are like whatever .rs, so I've been real scared like putting my credit card into some like weird Serbian registrar website. Um, but anyway, so we compile the program once and that does a whole bunch of work and then we get this binary out and we run it. Um, and so by separating out these two steps, that's one aspect in which Rust is significantly faster than Ruby. It doesn't have to redo all that work every time. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, as I said, we could do that in MRI if we wanted to. Um, here's, a, here's a better example of how Ruby's design makes it significantly slower, but also gives it, you benefit for that slowness. Um, who knows how Ruby's method lookup algorithm works? Yeah, I thought so. Not very many people, actually. It just kind of works intuitively, but there's actually a relatively complicated algorithm that looks like this. Um, so when you call a method in Ruby at all, uh, the first thing that it does, it says sets the current class to the receiver. So we start off with our current class, and then we look through the method table in the current class, which is the list of all of the methods that we know about, and if we found that method, then we can call it. Um, but if we don't find that method, we go over there and it set the current class to the super class of the current class. And then we look again. We look in its method table. And then if we don't find it, we go to that super class and that super class and that super class. And then I didn't put this on the slide, but if, if we don't find the method there, uh, then we try to call method, method missing on your class, and if your class doesn't implement it, your super class, and your super class, and your super class, and then finally, it'll throw a no method error uh, if you don't have it. So there's two things about this algorithm. Uh, the first one is, as you'll notice, there's a lot of steps and that it's recursive, um, but the second one is that we, when we make a Ruby object, there has to be this method table. So like Ruby needs to store extra memory for every single object you create to keep track of these kinds of things. Um, and that's what gives Ruby its wonderful dynamic nature. Like, I love the fact that I can do almost anything in Ruby. I can take a class and add methods and remove methods. Um, the first time I gave this talk was right after the current RSpec maintainer was giving a very detailed technical explanation of how RSpec mocks go to very great lengths to make sure that they don't mess with your methods. So. Uh, yeah, it gets very, very complicated um, if you dig into more advanced Ruby. And that's wonderful, but it also comes with a cost. So that's Ruby. Um, here's a Ruby program. Uh, I'm going to be showing some other ones. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Nope, it doesn't actually get bigger, sorry. Um, just def foo, it takes an argument x and then returns a 5. Uh, I just wanted to make this simple. The problem with demo programs is that no matter how simple or complicated you make them, someone's not happy, so I just made a dumb, very simple program. Um, returns five no matter what argument you pass it. Um, so now let's talk about Rust. I'm gonna show you some Rust code for the first time. Um, here's the same program in Rust. So uh, we have the fn keyword instead of def um, because typing out function is terrible. Uh, JavaScript taught me that. Um, and then foo x, we have to annotate a type. So there's a 32-bit integer is the type of the argument, and it returns a 32-bit integer. 
And then we also need this main function to tell Rust where the code actually starts executing. So the first thing you'll notice is that programming in Rust involves a little more ceremony and a little more annotations, but we get a lot of benefit for that downside, just like we get benefit from the downside of Ruby being complicated. Um, the benefit is this is the assembly language that Rust spits out for that method call. Uh, or that function call. So in Ruby, we had to do that complicated algorithm and allocate all these memory, um, all these function lookup tables and stuff. And this is like 20 lines of assembly. Um, I actually think assembly is kind of readable lately. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm getting weird. Um, I have some friends who are like, assembly programming is easier than web programming because here's a step-by-step -step single set of instructions. They're very, very basic. It just does what it says on the tin. Whereas you on the web take a presentation language and an entire scripting language and a markup language and you bundle them together and you send them to another computer on the other side of the planet and for some reason you expect that that's going to work. Like I'm gonna go back to my simple basic assembly language. Um, so this, what this assembly code does is it, uh, it pushes a, a value onto a register and then call queue calls the foo function Foo is defined up here. Um, we actually like move one argument off of uh, this register, and then uh, we return that value. Um, and then when we return, we put the result back into another register, and then return from main. That's it. Very straightforward. This is pretty much as fast as you can get. There's a couple of things in here. I'm not sure what they do yet. I haven't quite figured it out. But generally speaking, like complicated method resolution algorithm versus 10 lines of assembly. Like, that's kind of the difference. Um, so this is very, very fast, but it's not quite as flexible. Let's make our program a little more complicated. Now let's introduce a class. So here we have a class foo. Uh, we define a method called hello and just return a string hello, and then we make a new foo object and call that hello method on it. Nothing too complicated. Um, it's pretty basic Ruby. Let's see how you would write the same code in Rust. Um, in Rust, we explicitly don't mix our data and our behavior. So our data comes in the form of structs, and this, this struct has no data, so it's just empty. We just say struct foo. And then um, the impl keyword is for implementation, is where we put our behavior. So they're in separate kind of blocks. And we say that we're going to implement some behavior on foo. Here's a function, hello, um, that takes one argument of self and returns a string. Um, in Ruby, we have an implicit self. Rust is more like Python, where self is explicit. It's the first argument to your function. Um, and then in main, we say let f equals foo and f dot hello. So this like, kind of looks very familiar in many ways. It's similar, there's some differences, but it's nothing too incredibly different. Um, this compiles to 82 lines of assembly code in total, as opposed to making all those classes and doing allocation and all that stuff that happens um, in the Ruby version. And what's funny is I realized after I made this slide that I compiled it without optimizations on. So one of the things that we can do in Rust very heavily is analyze your program to figure out if we can make it faster by doing a bunch of tricks. And uh, these optimizations are uh, very, very, very good at making things very, very fast. Um, I'll give you a link to a video. You can watch for that later. Um, but after... After optimization, it goes from 82 lines of assembly to 30 lines of assembly. And what's funny about this, I was going to put the 30 lines up there, but it's a lot, and it's the morning. Um, for, it's too early in the morning for 30 lines of assembly code. Uh, but what's really funny is the program is actually basically empty. All those 30 lines are just like set up and tear down stuff that the compiler does for every program, no matter how complicated. And so what we're actually able to do is uh, Rust looks at this code and it says, okay, you call the hello method, but you don't do anything with its return value, which is basically a constant. So we don't need to call that method because it doesn't actually do anything. And then if we're not calling that method, we don't need to define f either because we're not using it anymore. So don't do anything for that either. And then we have an empty main function. So then it says, okay, we never call this f hello function, so don't generate code for that. And then we never use this foo struct so it just goes away too. So you're basically left with a totally empty program, which is the fastest possible program. Is just, you know, the only way to win is not to play. Um, 
So yeah, so that's one of the other really cool things um, is that your Rust programs get very fast because of optimizations. Let's go back to the Ruby a little bit and add a tiny bit more of complexity. Um, one of the things I love about Ruby is its module system. You're able to mix and match things together. Uh, I, I don't like the module system when I'm working with Rails, though. If you've ever looked at like a, a Active Record model class, last time I checked, it had about 45 Ancestor modules mixed in, and three of them were anonymous. Um, so yeah, it gets complicated. But anyway, so here we have this bar module. It defines our hello function. And then we include bar into our foo class and call the method. So this is kind of the same, but you know, abstracting it out into a module. In Rust, we have a very similar kind of concept called traits. So uh, with a trait, we define just the, the signature of the function, but we don't actually implement it. And then we can say implement this trait for this struct and have a function there that returns something. And then you end up with basically the same kind of thing. So again, this sort of feels like Ruby, but there are some significant differences that I want to get into. Um, but I'm going to show you a little more Ruby code first. Um, in, in Ruby, when we pass f objects to functions, we don't say anything about what those functions can do. So this hello function will call hello on its argument, and it has no idea if hello is actually a method that's been implemented, or if it's a method that's a result of method missing, or like in what way will it work. This might throw no method error. You might pass something that doesn't have a, foo a hello function sorry, um, to th this hello. But in Ruby, this kind of works, and we just, you know, get on with our day. Uh, it's, it's really, really, we call this duck typing, right? So as long as it uses hello, that's totally fine. Um, in Rust, it gets a teeny bit more complicated. So here, um, this is the same code in Rust. Uh, we add this t colon bar syntax. So t colon bar says, this function hello can take any type that implements our bar trait from earlier. And you know the bar trait says that it has a hello method on it. Um, and then it takes one argument of type t. So this, this will work for anything that implements that trait. And so that little extra bit of annotation um, does a whole lot. It not only helps document what the actual, like what you're supposed to be passing to this function, but it also lets us get away with a ridiculous amount of optimization that I'm gonna show you. Um, so if we have two structures and they both implement that bar trait, we can pass both of them to this method and this just works just fine. Um, again, there's that little bit of annotation burden, but now we have two classes using this particular function. So what Rust does is this complicated looking word called monomorphization. Uh, mono means one and morph means form. So what happens is it takes that generic function, hello, and it says, okay, you called it with two different structures. So instead of making the same function for both and having both of them share it, what it does is it makes a hello foo function where it takes foo, uh, a foo as an argument and it takes a hello, the other one, I should have picked a better variable name, I guess it's cux or quux, I never know how to say that one, oh well. Um, and so then it changes the calls to be the specific versions. So we don't pay the runtime overhead of being generic here. It's just like we had written specialized versions of the functions ourselves. And using generics, uh, like generic functions in that way, is significantly slower than working like this. I don't have time to explain more about why it's so uh, in this talk, but trust me, this is way, way faster. Um, and you can write code that looks like Ruby but gets rid of all this overhead. Um, again, this compiles down to those same 30 lines of nothing assembly. Even though we've used more complicated language constructs, it still just works. Um, so I've shown you a little bit about how these two languages relate. Um, you can actually use Rust with Ruby. So in the actual documentation um, of Rust itself, I wrote a chapter on how to make Ruby gems in Rust. Um, and Yehuda uh, Katz has also been doing these videos lately. There's one that's an hour long and one that's two hours long about uh, him writing a Ruby gem um, in Rust. So uh, Discourse, the forum that uses Rails on the back end and Ember on the front end, um, they noticed that the string blank method was very slow, so they re-implemented it in C and got a significant amount of speed up. 
Um, and it's about like 100 lines of C code, and it's, it looks like C code, and it's very complicated. Um, so Yehuda tried rewriting it in Rust instead of in C. And in Rust, it's a one-liner that looks exactly like the Ruby function. And the Rust version is actually faster than the C version. Um, so if you're interested in the details of why that is, you should check out Yehuda's recent videos. He goes into it at length, like I said, one hour and two hour. I'm not going to do that to you right now. But the point is, is that Ruby gives us great flexibility and like wonderful, like Matt's made Ruby to make programmers happy, right? So Ruby is super flexible, but that means sometimes it's slow. And Rust gives us a great amount of performance, and it's pretty flexible, but it can't do all the things that Ruby can do. And so I don't want to tell you that like, you should stop writing Ruby and start writing all your stuff in Rust or something. I think that's silly. Like Programming languages have different strengths and different weaknesses, and they're both cool for different reasons. And so I think that you should recognize that all programming languages are pretty cool. And instead of talking so much trash about other programming languages on Twitter, we should just Deal with it. Um, so, uh, okay. So I made these these turtles. Um, my partner Ashley drew most of these slides, but I got to do a little teeny bit. She has much better handwriting than I do. And so I was like, I want to make the turtles go fast. So I'm going to make like puffs of smoke coming out of the turtles. But they, it kind of looks like they're farting. So I left it in because it's fun. Um, but yeah. So anyway, yeah. Go forth, try new programming languages, learn cool stuff from them, bring them to Ruby, uh, bring Ruby's lessons to other programming languages. One of the things that Yehuda and I have been doing in the Rust world is bringing the developer experience that we all expect out of Ruby into a lower level language like Rust. So for example, in Rust, you don't use make files. You use a tool called Cargo, which is basically Bundler. And so that's like a significant nicer step than most of the stuff you've done before. And so languages can learn things from each other, and it improves both of them. So that's what I've been doing with my life lately. Uh, and that is my talk. Uh, thank you so much again for having me.